Okay, let's talk about applying the first fun, uh, the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, this happens to be my second attempt at this video because I was covering the microphone on the first one. Stuff happens. So remember uh, back when I first started talking to you about the fundamental theorem of calculus, we created this accumulation function. We called it A of X, which just figured out the area, computed the area under the function f of t. So this is f of t. And this a of x computed the func the area, excuse me, the area uh, under the function f of t from point a to some value x. And we could move x back and forth, slide it back and forth to change the amount of area that we were computing. And each value of x has its own y value. Uh, a of x. And the notation that we used to write out a of x was the integral from a to x of f of t dt, right? Just the area under the curve. And we blew past this uh, working through this uh, construction because we wanted to get to, you know, the fundamental theorem part two, which was capital F of b minus capital F of a, right? So we could compute a definite integral with an antiderivative. Along the way, though, we... Uh, did some stuff, and we ended up saying that the derivative of a of x equaled f of x. And that is an important piece of information. It's basically saying, right, since a of x is this definite integral here, if I know the derivative of a of x equals f of x, what I'm really saying is, that if I have a definite integral and I want to take the derivative of the definite integral, right? Because this is just a of x. That equals f of x. And this happens to be the statement of the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Our textbook calls it part one, right? Oops, that was bad handwriting. But this is the statement of part one. Now, let me show you why it's important. It's basically giving us a formula for taking the derivative of a definite integral that has a constant in the a position of the definite integral and the variable x in the top position. And what it's saying is if you're doing the derivative of this thing, it's really just the function with x plugged in, meaning we just take the x and we stick it where the t is. And that's really it for applying this theorem. You know, there's a lot more going on with the theorem. It has something to do with that construction that we set up, and it was getting us toward the second part of the fundamental theorem that we use all the time to compute definite integrals. Uh, but I just wanted to point out to you that it is a useful statement in and of itself because it allows us to take the derivative of these definite integrals. So let's take a look at a couple examples. And these problems that I'm going to show you, they come right off the handout uh, for this lesson. But this is the classic example, the classic case for finding the derivative, right, of a function. This function happens to be called F, uh, capital F. But we're trying to find the derivative, and the statement of the function is one of these definite integrals. And look, here's a letter X in the B position of the definite integral. So based on that, uh, fundamental theorem part one, we're just going to take the x and put it where t is, and we'll write out our derivative. So it's this easy. f prime, the derivative of capital F, is just x squared, right, instead of t squared, plus 6x instead of 6t, plus 7. Notice, we don't actually take the antiderivative, right? We're doing the derivative of an integral. So it makes sense that if you do something and then undo it, you end up where you started. So we end up where we started, which was t squared plus 60 plus 7, except that the letter x has been plugged in. That's how this thing pretty much works. Now, what we'll see on the next slide is it, is it does get a little weird when this x is not just an x, but some other function of x. When that happens, we do have to apply the chain rule. Anytime you're doing a derivative of a composition, you have to apply the chain rule. So let's take a look on the next slide at what that really means. 
So the instructions for this problem are the same. We're trying to find capital F prime. Notice this time that top spot is filled by a function of x, x squared. The other thing I want you to pay attention to is the bottom is still a constant. Now, it does not matter what that bottom number is. As long as it's a constant, we apply the theorem, right? And so we're going to do the same thing here, but there's a twist. After we take the x squared and put it where t is, we also have to multiply by the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. So as I write down my answer to this problem, I start out the same way I did on the other problem. I'm going to take the x squared and put it where the t was, so it's negative 3 over x squared now. But because of the chain rule, because I'm doing composition, I have to multiply by the derivative of x squared, which is 2x. And then we'll simplify this thing. What is this going to be? Negative 6 over x, right? Because the x squared and the x kind of reduce. So the derivative of this particular function that's defined by a definite integral is just negative 6 over x. That's the derivative. And the catch is that when you deal with these compositions, you have to follow the chain rule. Everybody loves a chain rule, right? The doggone chain rule. Okay, so just when you think you have this mastered, we throw a little curveball at you. And what happens is we make both of these positions here variable expressions. And when that happens, we just have to follow some rules for definite integrals. So let's take a look at one of those examples on the next slide. Instructions for this problem are the same. We want to find the derivative of capital F. But notice the definition of this function is different than the other ones. To apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, we need a constant in this position. And we have a function of x there. Now, we do have the function of x that we wanted on top, so that's good. But there's, there's a problem here. Um, remember that that first fundamental theorem is stated like this. The derivative of a definite integral, and there's a constant a down in that position, and there's a variable x here of f of t dt is just f of x. Okay? This has to be a constant, and we don't have that right now. So what we do is we force the issue. I think you'll agree that somewhere between x and x squared, there's a constant, right? For instance, there's a number between 2 and 4, which would be 3 or any of those other numbers in between there. Now, there's always a value between x and x squared, except maybe 0, right? And so what we're going to do is split this definite integral into two pieces. We'll say, and this is still the function. I haven't taken the derivative yet. We'll say instead of writing it as one definite integral, we'll write it into two definite integrals. We'll split that interval between x and x squared. We'll go from x to this number a that we know is in between x and x squared. And we'll write down the definite integral of e to the 2t dt. And then we'll pick up where we left off and compute the other definite integral, starting at a and finishing off at x squared. 2e to the t dt. Now, this right-hand expression, we can directly apply the fundamental theorem. So let's just do that right now. It's just like the chain rule one we did the other, uh, the other slide. I'm going to take the 2x squared, stick it where the t is, and then multiply by 2x. It's just x squared, not 2x squared. So this is 2e to the x squared times, by the chain rule, 2x. And we'll simplify that in a minute. There's an issue over here, and that is these bad boys are not in the right order. I want to flip them over so they match the theorem. When you flip them over, remember, that's the opposite of what the value should be, so we have to stick a negative sign in front of it. So I'm about to compute this definite integral, and this one's pretty straightforward too because I'm just going to take the x and put it where t is. Okay, so let's keep this thing rolling here. For this definite integral, it's just going to be negative 2e to the x. 
And then let's simplify this thing a little bit. That's going to be 4xe to the x squared, just by simplifying. And so using our technique where we split this into two definite integrals, we end up being able to compute the derivative using the fundamental theorem part 1. So this number 11 here and the problems that are like it, it's a little challenging. Just remember you got to split the definite integral into two pieces. And we can do that because we can split this interval up. And then don't forget about this. When you switch the order of integration, you have to put a negative sign in front of the definite integral. Okay, hopefully this one sounds better than the last video I tried to make. Uh, give these a shot. You know, there's no pressure right now. We're just trying to uh, exercise our, our math skills here while we are hunkered down at home during this, you know, crazy situation. So, um, you know, let me know. Let me know how you do on these. And uh, I'll, of course, uh, give you some tips if you need help. Take care, you guys. See ya.